Hello, this is Adrian Pasuti with uh, Crooked Lane Brewing Company. I am joined by my lovely wife, Teresa Pasuti, and Big Mike Moore. Uh, we are uh, here to, to sit down and talk about uh, some barrel aging, and uh, part of the, the showcase of uh, our discussion today is going to be surrounding um, the release of our upcoming uh, Gnarly Goat, which is a barrel aged Doppelbach uh, that we're going to release for our anniversary uh, this year. So, Teresa, why don't you give some details on the beer, and then uh, we'll pass it on to Mike and circle back around. So a Doppelbach is a malty German lager. It's one of the strongest lagers um, that's a traditional German style. And we have loved this style for a long time. We decided to brew one um, last year, around this time actually in September timeframe. And as well as, as just brewing a straight Doppelbach, we decided to put, um, put it in a couple of bourbon barrels as well, just as an experiment to see what happened. We're pretty new to the world of barrel aging, so we wanted to just make that experiment and see what happened. As the course of the year went through, we actually won um, a gold medal for our Doppelbach in a number of um, beer competitions, most importantly, the California State Beer Commercial commercial beer competition, as well as uh, second place best in show. Um, our Gnarly Goat, which is the barrel aged version of this beer, uh, won a silver medal as well. So as we're coming up on our year anniversary, we are planning to uh, bottle and release the Gnarly Goat, as well as some of the Doppelbach that we brewed this, uh, this past summer. Yeah, this, this beer is just so fine. The base beer, like they said, gold medal winner from the California State Fair. Just a wonderful beer that has notes of honey, treacle, a little bit of molasses, but brown sugar, and then this toasted graham cracker wonderfulness that is Doppelbach. And uh, we compare it, we have compared it here to celebrate it, one of the world's best Doppelbachs, and it compared almost seamlessly, same type of beer. And then you put this in an oak barrel, uh, bourbon oak barrel nonetheless that has some of those same notes of honey maybe a little roasted nuts uh, graham cracker a little bit more spirits and higher alcohol and you bring out the best of both worlds and uh, that's what this is a very fine liquid beverage right here so the Doppelbach as a style is made um, ours is made with all German malts and it has a high proportion of Munich malts and Kira Munich and whenever you hear Kira as far as a, as a name of a malt it means it's been uh, caramelized so it's been um, heated in the malting process to really develop some of these um, really sweet caramely toasty flavors um, so our, our Doppelbach contains tons of these malts. It's not evolving a really dark color, but it's got a real richness that we really appreciate. And um, as, I, as I said before, it's a lager, so it, it ferments for a very long time. Um, we ferment our lagers pretty cold, and we age them out over a, a long period of time because we're trying to really develop a smooth flavor. Um, Doppelbach tends to be perceives very sweet and the reason for that is it's got um, in proportion to the higher alcohol this this one comes in the base beer comes in at 8.6 percent alcohol after um, well in, in the brewing process it's the the amount of bittering that's added for this higher alcohol beer is pretty minimal so it's very it's perceived as not having a lot of hop flavor um, it's, it's sweet and rich and tastes like dessert, basically. Um, so, as we were saying, when we uh, barrel age a beer, we're aging in a bur bourbon barrel. Well, there is some bourbon left in the barrel, so when you age a beer like this, you typically come out with a higher alcohol version. So the Gnarly Goat is, is coming in right about 9% alcohol. So Doppelbach is a very, um, like I said, a very malty, lager style and it's one of our favorites going back for years. We, um, for our recipe that we developed here at Crooked Lane, we took Munich malt, Kara Munich, um, and anytime you hear Kara something in a, in a malt's name, it means it was um, heated and there were some caramelization reactions, some Maillard reactions that go and create this really rich um, malty flavor in a beer. This beer has very low IBUs, it's in the 20s. 
So when you drink it, it's perceived as being malty and sweet, um, but it is it does have a balance, but it's it's quite far on the sweet side. Um, and because of these things, we we wanted to brew um, the Doppelbach as a you know higher alcohol beer. It's an 8.6% alcohol, and then. As it goes into the bourbon barrels, it's going to pick up some bourbon. It's going to pick up some spirits from from the vessel, and it actually is up to nine percent for the gnarly goat. So, why is Doppelbach a good beer to throw in a barrel? Well, I think Mike had alluded to that in the the introduction that the flavor composition of this beer and the the way the malts are laid yeah. out, the low bitterness rate, the low hopping rate, all meld really well with the flavors that you pull from bourbon from bourbon or Absolutely. from from a you know a charred barrel basically so i think when you when you have uh bourbon is normally associated with like imperial stouts and that's good too because chocolate and whiskey go together pretty well uh right but so do really really nice sweet things you ever had i hate to say this but you ever had baklava and bourbon together best match ever well this this has some of those same kind of notes you ever had pecan pie and bourbon best match ever so that's what you get when you have all the same type of uh tastes going on you just add to the common core and make it better than the whole the whole of the actual beer and everything that's why that works so well now, there's not that many Doppelbachs in the world, honestly. There's not that many made um, locally or, or regionally. And so I don't know that I've ever seen a bourbon barrel-aged Doppelbach. So that feel, feels like something that's either, you know, like happenstance or risky or innovative. So <laughs> I think for us, I can say innovative now because the experiment has turned out pretty well, but it's, uh, it's not something you see every day. Yeah, and I think the, the, the thing I really like about this beer is that the base beer in any barrel aging beer that you're going to do, uh, any type of a fruit beer that you're going to do, you have to start with a good, solid base beer or yes. you're not going to improve on it. Just adding fruit to something or just throwing something in a barrel that is a crappy beer to start with is just going to give you another layer of complexity on a crappy beer. Um, you may get lucky and be able to uh, recover a beer that way, but nine times out of ten, you're just gonna make a bad beer. You're gonna you're gonna take additional time on that bad beer and, and make it worse. Um, the thing I really like about this beer is that by putting it in the barrels, it significantly increase the depth of complexity of this beer. It, yeah. it layered this whole other set of flavors and aromas on top of what I felt already was a fabulous beer that it, it just took it to this this next level of, of every time I taste this beer, depending on whether I focus on the early palate, the mid palate, the late palate, I can pick up different flavors and it goes on. I'll take a sip and 30 seconds after I've had that sip, I'm still tasting something and it's, it's triggering something in my mind of uh, a memory of uh, uh, correlating it to a, a different beer that I've had. And th that there's just something, uh, for lack of a better term, magical about uh, that experience for me. So. I really feel like when, um, when you have a beer that's, that's complex in the right way. It's like it's almost like a chord of music where you're not having too much bass and not too much trouble and there's no off key. It's just like it harmonizes really well and um, yeah, that's that's the best way I can describe a well-made um, complex beer. Is it just it's like a it's like a beautiful piece of music. It is. It's like a symphony, and the fact that uh, bourbon has some of those same characteristics that you're rising it to. I've said this before. You're rising it to another level, and this really works well. There aren't very many bourbon barrel doppelbox. They are out there. They're hard to find, but there's a lot of bourbon barrel wee heavies, a lot of bourbon barrel strong Scotch ales. But those are also sweet. Anything that's sweet, and then you add this caramely note to it, and increase the alcohol to it. A, it's going to age longer, okay? Hops drop out immediately. Since there's not very many hops in here, it's good from the get-go. 
but it will also age and get more complex in the bottle. What I mean by that is the sugars will get more intense. The melanoid reaction between the mulch and the sugar will get more intense. And the alcohol will get a little bit more intense, especially if uh, you don't filter all the way. Maybe you leave just a little bit of yeast, it'll get more and more intense. And that's, that's what makes barrel aging beers wonderful. Yeah, that, so that brings up the, the one of the good topics or discussion points of, of how long is appropriate on aging. And, you know, from a, the brewer's perspective, when we have aged the, this beer and other beers, uh, like Teresa had mentioned, we, we haven't done a lot of these, but uh, everything I've read and, and our experience has been we taste them almost on a monthly basis. So we're pulling a sample out. And we're tasting for the different flavor combination or uh, combinations that uh, are developing in this product, and that's what we used as a gauge to say this beer is right. And and I can say for this one in particular, uh, the first three or four months it continued to get better and better, but it was still somewhat hot, meaning we were tasting pretty high alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, the sweetness level was there, but it, it, it felt like it was, uh, was kind of masked by some of the alcohol notes that were in there. And that, at some point in there, continued to decrease enough where it fell into the background, and all we got was just, uh, for lack of, again, a better term, deliciousness of, the, the consistency of flavor from the first sip to the finish on this beer. And that's when we knew it was, it was finished in the barrel, pulled it out of the barrel uh, and, and carved it. Now, um, we're gonna package this out in uh, 750 milliliter bottles. So I'll throw that out to you guys. What, what do you think as far as uh, you know, laying down or aging this, uh, this bottle and, and uh, what length of time and, and how's the character in this beer gonna change over time? So, Oh, I got that one. This is going to be great. Okay, <laughs> whenever you age, age beer, first of all, it has to be really close to over 7 or 7% 7 more. You just can't get any kind of beer. So people ask me all the time, why can't I age my triple IPAs? Well, IPAs are meant to drunk fresh because that's why you get the fresh hops. Why spend all that money for fresh hops when you're just going to age them? Conversely, in Lambic area, in the Seine River Valley in Belgium, they age hops for three years before they even put it in the bottle. They use hops for one thing and one thing only, and that's as a preservative, so no bugs get in the bottle. So that's aging beers. You don't ever would never age an IPA. Even Plenty the Elder and the people at Russia or whatever go, no, 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 drink fresh, drink fresh, drink fresh. They don't even sell it. Vinny's wife will go out of her way to hunt you down if you hold on to Plenty the Elder. It's a true story. So do not age pale ales, IPAs, Kolsch's, stuff like that. However, something that's 8%, like you said, 8.6% 8 on this, and then put in a barrel, and it is sweet enough, and it is strong enough, will age for years, if not decades. Because, like I said before, you get this melanoid character, you get this increase of sugars that go through these multiple levels, layers of flavor, no different than your favorite cake, or your favorite pie that just goes through levels of flavor. And that's what beer is, beer is food. When they first made Doppelbach in the, in the region of Einbeck in Germany, you had very, very cold seasons. And this kept them warm. And they never thought of aging it in bourbon barrels because where were they going to get the bourbon? I don't know if too much <laughs> bourbon and a lot of schnapps, but not too much bourbon in Germany. But a beer like this will be perfect because I'm drinking it right, right now on release. But I think this beer will last five to six years perfectly. There you go. You know, the, the beautiful thing to do would be to brew this beer every year, release it around the same time every year, and then you could a open vertical. a bottle and taste how it changes year to year. You know, as long as it's packaged properly, it will it will change. It will change in character um, in a positive way for a good long time. Yep. Yeah, and so to that point, uh, you're looking at all the barrels behind us. That's exactly what we just did. I mean, we, we brewed this beer again uh, about a month to six weeks ago. Uh, it has been aged and fermented out uh, as far as the, the primary fermentation process and it's still in lagering. Uh, we just filled another eight barrels with uh, this beer for basically it'll be the 2018 release of, of this product and so we will be able to in another year from now you know do a kind of a side-by-side -side comparison Perfect. of what mm -hmm. uh, what the 2017 version of this beer and the 2018 uh, you know will taste like so. 
that's what a lot of breweries do. They're very successful at that. And I think that is a great way for the beer aficionado, beer collector, and or beer store, especially wood age beers, works really well. They want to see how that works, especially with their friends. How did this one go? How did this one go? How did this one go? It's amazing stuff. So as a, as a burgeoning beer collector, I I'd collect love beer, to, yes. I, well, well, for you myself yeah. and for anyone who, you know, is just getting started collecting beers, what is the best way to store bottles that you're aging? Yeah. So uh, you first off, yeah, well, let's talk about this one. If you're doing crown and cap, then you store them upright, all right? And in a beer like this, uh, people go, well, headspace is pretty important, but you don't really worry about that because oxygen already got to the beer through the actual barrel. So you're really not worried about oxygen per se. And everybody goes, oh, you're gonna let oxygen in here because, the, no, no, that's gonna make it more complex in the future. That's what's gonna make your five-year-old gnarly goat taste like the finest Madeira and the best sherry you ever had is that little headspace. And you'll see some will evaporate and it may go down to here, even here. That is not a bad thing at all. Now, if you have a cork in cage, you wanna lay it on its side so the cork is always wet. So as a consumer, those are the only two, only two considerations on aging beer, but you wanna have a cool, no vibrations, and no heat fluctuations, especially over 20 degrees near here, near there. So vibration's huge, so you don't want it uh, at a place, if you're next to a railroad station, the whole place is going boom, 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 like that, no vibration. That's why all your beers are really, really bad when they come from Europe. <laughs> heat and vibration. It's on some tanker truck that's going through South Africa at 120 degrees and then it's always moving and splashing and everything. The worst you could do for beer. So once you have a wood aged beer or beer you're going to age, cool, calm, and collect a lot of it. So cool, calm, and collect it right there. So what's cool? Like what do you consider cool? Cool uh, under 55 if you can. If you can just, on the higher, higher the alcohol, you can go 10 more degrees. So hmm. you could actually start this at 70 because it's pretty high at a 7%, probably 60. Uh, if it's a 12%, you can get away with storing it at 80 degrees. Hmm. But then you're gonna get a little bit more evaporation. So if you could just stick it at 60, 50 to 60, you're gonna be good regardless of what, what ABV is on the, on the. And why do you wanna store the corks ones on their side? Because you wanna keep the corks wet. If the corks get dry, these corks expand, they put them through and they expand through the bottle, right? If you hold them for 10 to 20 years, which I've seen in Germany and uh, Belgium especially, then the cork gets dry, it can actually pop open. Oh. It just no longer actually fits the thing and it goes right up and pops open. Hmm. For no reason at all on t year 12 or something, then you've lost all your beer. That's it. It's uh, the, the consumer aging beers is just a matter of having enough space, time and temperature. And um, if you have a lot of space, I'm very lucky. I have nine refrigerators. I store a whole room in my house that's nothing but wood age, barrel aged beers, and they age wonderfully. Now, the base beer, like Adrian said, the base beer has to be very, very good. If you start with a good product, just like any food product, you're going to end with a good product. And the Doppelbach was the second best in the state of California. You can't get much better than that. So, Adrian, what's the plan as far as the bottle release? Yeah, so this, this, the bottles of Gnarly Goat are going to be released for our anniversary uh, along with a, a nice commemorative uh, specialty piece of glassware which is a, a traditional Doppelbach glass that's got a gold rim and uh, a logo uh, with our one year anniversary on it. Um, our anniversary uh, weekend is, is targeted for the middle of September. This will be only a, a, an on-premise release, meaning it's not available uh, out in the world anywhere. Uh, there's about uh, 25 to 30 cases of, of this particular product that's going to be available for uh, sale uh, on-premise uh, only. So, wow. Well, yeah, to wrap this up in, in kind of summary, uh, we're, we're super excited to be able to release this beer. Uh, we've been, you know, kind of on and off tasting it out of the barrels for the last couple months, and, and we're, we're really excited to be able to share this with uh, some people. So, you know, I want to throw a thanks out to Big Mike for uh, for coming in to, uh, to sit down and uh, bear with our, our goofy antics for the day and uh, 
Um, yeah, to, to my uh, wife Teresa, who actually we co-brewed this beer, and uh, she she has brewed uh, I would say 90% of the beers here over the course of the you know the first year that we've been open. We're we're really excited for where we are now and, and where we're going um, you know as far as the future goes. So um, yeah, certainly the beer will be available uh, mid September uh, for our anniversary party. We'll we'll certainly post uh, multiple weeks in advance of our our anniversary uh, the release date of the beer and. Uh, yeah, certainly come up and, uh, and, and see us here. Uh, certainly a huge thanks for the first year of uh, the time that we've been open um, for all the, the patronage and local and distant support that we've received. Uh, we're we're su super uh, uh, grateful for everybody that's uh, supported in uh, the, the Crooked Lane family and, and what we've done and, and where we're going. So thanks and uh, cheers. 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 Ching, ching. Ching, ching. Ding. Prost.